Hey, really great to uh, be here. I've heard a lot about Ross Trevor over the years from Dan and Ellie, so it's, a real, uh, it's been a real privilege to get to know uh, Dan and Ellie and to meet Tommy for the first time uh, this weekend, and uh, really great to uh, be with the Ross Trevor family. Uh, as I said before, uh, our family is in a season of growth and multiplication. We've had our first two grandkids in the last uh, couple of years. We've got a beautiful granddaughter named Aurelia, and uh, I throw her in the pool and go swimming with her whenever I can because my big vision for the future, besides seeing revival in our nation, in our generation, is to one day stand in a swimming arena somewhere in Australia and hear over the loudspeaker swimming in lane seven is Aurelia from Australia. <laughs> and so I'm teaching her to swim whenever I get the chance. Uh, our daughter gave our first granddaughter this uh, beautiful Spanish princess name and then grandson comes along and what do they call him? Freddy. <laughs> uh, we love Freddy already. He's a, good, uh, he's, he's a good boy. But you can probably hear in my heart, even though you don't know me, I'm just loving watching my family grow and multiply and flourish. Who knows that we have a father in heaven that's a much better father than me? Come on, who knows that we've got a father in heaven that's a much better father than me? He, he, he wants his family to grow and to multiply and to flourish and he's cheering us all on uh, as we're all part of seeing that happen. I, I love one of your values here uh, at Ross Trevor, you know, everyone living uh, on God's mission. I want to talk today about the value of ones. Who remembers having pocketfuls of these one cent pieces? Come on, put your hand up if you remember having pocketfuls of these. Everyone's a little bit older. Some of you young people got no idea what we're talking about. Who can remember the animal on the back of the one cent piece? A type of possum? It was a feather tail glider. All right, feather tail glider on the back of the one cent piece. It's been a while since we've had some of these in our pocket. But once upon a time, every time you went to McDonald's and you got a Big Mac for $1.99 and you handed over a $2 note... You got one of these and it went in your pocket and then you went and bought a big black CD. Remember those? They were, they were about eleven ninety nine. You got one of these uh, in your pocket. Then in 1991, the Australian government decided that these had so little value that they'd stop making them. They just simply weren't the, worth the effort anymore because their value was so small. When you hand over 20 bucks this week for something that's worth 19.99, you deserve one of these. <laughs> but you won't care when they won't give you one because the value is so small. You see, the, the, the value of, of something is determined by what we have. You know, when my kids were little, I'd say to them, I'll give you 20 cents if you cut my toenails for me. They'd argue over it. You know, they, they, they'd, they'd want to do it because 20 cents had great value to them. Now that my kids are all in their 20s, if I said, I'll give you 20 cents to cut my toenails, they, they wouldn't even bother with a response. They just turn in disgust. You're disgusting, Dad. Because they got more money in their piggy bank than I got in the Commonwealth Bank. You know, it's not, there's not enough value in it for them. They won't make the sacrifice. They won't go to the effort. Now, this is true for all of us. The value of something determines how much effort or how much sacrifice we will make for it. I want you to imagine tomorrow morning, peak hour traffic, you're driving down uh, Main South Road, and there's traffic everywhere. Everyone's trying to get their kids to school. Everyone's trying to get into the office. And you see some money on the side of the road. It's lost. It's there for you to pick up. But to pick it up, you've actually you've driven past it. You've got to pull over onto the side of the road. You, you've got to take off your seatbelt. You've got to jump out of your car. You've got to uh, run back while people are abusing you in traffic. And you've got to pick up that money. You've got to run back into your car, close the door again, put your seatbelt back on, and then try and pull back out into traffic. All right? It's a fair bit of effort. You've got to go to to, to, to get that which is lost. I, I want you to be honest here this morning. Who would go to that much effort if you saw five cents on the side of the road? Okay, what about 10 cents? Anyone? No one's moving for 10 cents. Would you make the effort for 20 cents? Anyone making that effort? 
All right, anyone? 50 cents. You saw 50 cents on the side of the road. It's yours to pick up. Would you jump out of your car, run back and get it if you saw 50 cents? No one's moving yet. I can see a few twitchy little hands, but then no, no one's moving yet. Anyone? A dollar. You start to see something with a gold in it. You young guys have got far too much money, I tell you. <laughs> two, two dollars, you can get a little Happy Meal or something. Anyone, anyone getting out of the car for two dollars? I tell you what, I hope everyone in this church is tithing, Dan, because no one has moved yet. You know, who, who actually needs to see something? You saw five bucks, all right? You can get a Zinger meal. Someone's moving for five bucks, all right? You're going straight to KFC uh, with that, all right? Ten bucks. Who's getting out of their car? Who's going to that much effort? Yeah, there's a couple. I can see, I see those hands. There's a lot of, in the back row, all right? Who's waiting for a 20? Who's getting out of their car? Yeah, okay. Fair bit of effort being made, the value's going up. All right, who's waiting for 50? Who's getting out of their car for... Okay, the majority of us. Who's hanging out for a hunch? They don't give Baptist pastors $100 notes, so I say. It's true. When the value goes up, so does the effort. The value is something determines the effort, the sacrifice that we'll make to get it. It's why the poor old one cent piece is no longer in existence. Not worth the effort. I want to talk about God's heart for the ones, the way that he values the ones today. You'd think, you'd think that the God who you know, made the world and owns everything in it, or the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, You'd think that one of anything wouldn't be all that valuable to him. you think that all of the people, you know, all of the wealth, all of, the cre- all of what he has created in this world, you'd think that one of anything wouldn't have all that much value to him. But let me read some famous stories about the value of ones. It starts in Luke chapter 15. It says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners... We're all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Sometimes we forget that these three famous stories, you know, we're about to read, actually were told because this happened. Jesus was welcoming sinners and eating with them. And the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the religious people, were muttering under their breath, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. In their mind, these people had no value to God. And so if this man really was from God, he would not waste his time with these kind of people. That's why Jesus tells these three stories. Verse 3, it says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses just one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Let me pause there. Sometimes we've read these stories too many times. Actually, Jesus, no, I wouldn't. You know, hasn't your parents taught you that that a bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush? You've still got 99 sheep. Leave the one that's wandered off. You know, I uh, actually grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney, but I've got family live way out west in New South Wales on a sheep property. I used to love going out there as a young person on school holidays and a little bit older, as I got a little bit older, and uh, I used to love helping them round up the sheep. And I remember one day being out with my cousins, and we're probably rounding up about five or 600 sheep, and there was one sheep, you know, one sheep that had a bad leg and was hobbling and couldn't keep up with the rest of the mob. And my cousin said to me, you put that one sheep on the back of your motorbike and ride it back to the yards. Now that sounds simple, but have you ever tried to pick up a hundred kilo merino, put it on the back of your motorbike and then ride it up a hill? 
You know, I, I'm riding uh, up a hill and I got one hand on, on the accelerator and I got one hand on the clutch and I've got my third hand holding on to the sheep, you know, on the back of this motorbike. Sheep are heavy and sheep are stupid. Even though I'm trying to help this sheep, it kept jumping off the back of my motorbike and I'd have to circle back around, go back down the hill, pick him back up, put him on the motorbike, head back up, get about halfway up. Once again, he'd start wriggling off the back of my motorbike, fall off and I'd have to go back down, pick this sheep up, put it back on my motorbike, ride back up on the hill. After the third time of this sheep jumping off my my motorbike and me having to go down and get it, I just decided this one is not worth the effort. I left it behind. And I caught up, you know, to my my cousins who had the rest of the sheep. And my cousin said to me, where's that sheep? And I told him the story. Stupid thing, kept jumping off. It wasn't worth the effort. I left it behind. And country boys don't say much. But but he just looked at me. And and I could tell he was looking at me saying, are you stupid or something? (laughs) And I'm looking back at him going, mate, it's just one sheep. I found out one sheep has real value to a farmer like real tangible dollar value. He went all the way back down in his truck, picked up that sheep and brought it all the way back because one sheep has value. I've learned a lot about these passages by hanging out with modern day shepherds. Another time we were marking lambs and we had probably a hundred lambs in this little pen. I don't know if you've ever seen a hundred lambs in a pen, but it's kind of like youth group for sheep. They all play, they all play stacks on in the corner. And I thought it was really funny, but my cousin just had this terrified look on his face and he just starts pulling all these lambs off the stacks on because he knew underneath that the little one was getting crushed and he picked up this little lamb that was getting crushed and he starts giving mouth to mouth to a sheep and I'm thinking I'm related to this dude I I mean he's, he's kissing a sheep I mean that's a lot of effort for one little sheep poor thing went to sheep heaven but that is a lot of effort for one sheep this is what Jesus is saying one while sheep has real value to a shepherd, it says in verse 5, when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. Puts it on his shoulders, takes it home, big effort. And then the story gets a little bit crazy. When he finds one lost sheep, he gathers all of his other shepherd mates together and, and they throw a big party because they've found one lost sheep. And Jesus obviously realises after telling this story, these guys are thick, they haven't got it. And so he tells an almost identical story. It goes on uh, to say, I suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. Same story. One is lost. And when that one is lost, that one becomes the priority and all out search is called for until that one is found. And when that one is found, everyone in the community comes together and celebrates because one lost coin is found. Jesus is still looking around at the crowd and he's going, they still don't get it. So he tells a story that every parent in the room would understand. He says, imagine a dad has two sons and loses one of them. How much would that dad want that son to be found? And he makes the point, this isn't about one lost sheep, it's not about one lost coin, but every lost person matters to God. Verse 7 and 10 are almost identical verses. He says, I tell you, when one lost person, when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. Whenever God says one thing three times, it's really important. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus is making a very important point here. In fact, it's the only time 
that he repeats a parable three times to make one really important point. Every one lost person matters to God. Every one lost person is valuable to God. The relationship that God wants with every single person on planet Earth is like, you know, a a loving father and a dependent child. And every child is precious. Every single person you ever lock eyes with is present. And remember, the value of that which is lost determines the sacrifice that you're willing to make. How much does God value you when you were lost, when your sin separated you from the love of the Father? How much did he value you? He sent his one and only son into the world. It's not that you loved God, but he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. How much does he value you? He sent his son as a sacrifice for your sins. His one and only son. I want you to remember this morning, you're one of the ones. When you were lost and all out search was called for you, you you became the priority. And whenever you put your faith in Jesus Christ, there was a party in heaven with your name on it. There was a cake with your name in it. There was a party in all of heaven. All of the angels got together and celebrated because you were once lost, but now you are found. You are one of the ones. But this is a really important point. It's the reason Jesus is telling these stories is you're not the only ones. Every person you ever lock eyes with who has not yet found that loving relationship with God, their creator, the Father of heaven, is valuable to God. I came across this poster a few years ago in the uh, Salamanca markets in uh, Hobart. I'd never uh, seen uh, this, this photo before. It might be a photo of a ship, uh, Ernest Shackleton, uh, and the Endurance in 1914. Uh, he took off with 28 men. They would be the, they were crossing over the Weddell Sea and they wanted to be the first people ever to walk uh, to Antarctica uh, on foot. And after six weeks of uh, battling floating pack ice, they, the endurance actually got wedged in this spot. And they were wedged there for 281 days until eventually the endurance was crushed and it was sank. And so Ernest Shackleton with his men took seven rowboats and they dragged them for six weeks over 100 kilometres of, of ice until they got to this uninhabited island called Elephant Island and they survived by eating seals and penguins but their food was running out and they knew that they weren't going to survive. So Shackleton took seven men in one little 20-foot row boat called the James Cairn and they rode for two weeks over 1500 kilometres through the ferocious Weddell Sea back to the nearest inhabited place, a whaling station on South Georgia Island and finally they got there and they had to climb over 40 kilometres of, uh, of glaciers and by the time they found, got to this whaling station they were naked, they were starving, they were freezing but they were now found and they could be fed, and they could get warm. This is what Shackleton wrote when he got there. He says, When we got to the whaling station, it was the thought of all those comrades left behind that made us so mad with joy. We didn't so much feel safe as that they would now be saved. Those men could have stayed there and enjoyed the safety and comfort of that whaling station. They were alive. They were safe. But three days, three days after arriving, shackled and chartered a boat to go back and get the rest of his men. And he didn't make it. The boat wasn't big enough. And they came back and he had to get another boat. Second attempt, didn't make it. He could have given up at this point and he had to wire for money from London and he emptied his bank accounts to buy a bigger boat. On the third attempt... He made it all the way back to, uh, to his men. And this is what it says on the bottom of that poster that I found in uh, Hobart. It says, The endurance became firmly wedged in ice and was eventually crushed. Ernest Shackleton with some of his men rode 800 miles in an open boat to get help for the men that were left behind. Listen to this. Not one man was lost. Not one man was lost. It now hangs on my office wall 
And it reminds me every time I walk into my office that the sacrifice of actually leading uh, the church in Australia, of leading a group of people, being uh, a group of disciples, living together on mission to reach lost people is worth the effort because the heart of God, the heart of our Father is that not one man, not one woman, not one child, not one young person would be lost, but everyone would be found. And we're all part, we're all living on God's mission together and everyone you ever lock eyes with that does not know the saving power of Jesus Christ in their life is worth the effort. Everyone is valuable to God and all out search is called for until they're found. Everyone is so valuable to God that they become the priority for the people of God. Everyone is so valuable to God that when one lost person is found, the whole community celebrates. I just want to pick up four things as I finish, you know, from these stories, just putting it into practice if we're going to be a people of that everyone is living uh, on mission for God. Firstly, notice the ones. You see in these stories, the, the shepherd noticed one lost sheep. The woman lo- noticed one lost coin. God notices one lost person. And he calls us to notice one lost person. Sometimes we, we think of the, the commission that Jesus has given us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. It's just too big. It's too hard. Where do we start? Start by noticing the ones. You know, in 2008, I was in uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I was investigating what it would mean to uh, start a vocational training centre for girls who were rescued from sex trafficking. And uh, just it was a miraculous story of God that got us there. And after a week of talking to a whole bunch of people, I got to the end of that week and I'm sitting in a tuk-tuk just outside this brothel where Nita lived. Nita was sold as a 12-year-old for her body and she was abused every night for years. She wanted desperately to escape, but she had no education, no job, no way of getting out. Brothel owner's son fell in love with her and they had this little baby and the brothel owner said, when that baby comes of age, she too will be trafficked. I remember sitting in that tuk-tuk and about to get on a comfortable plane to go back to comfortable Brisbane and in my head, I'm going, it's too hard. I don't know how to do this. And I just had this whisper of the Spirit in my heart. Do it for Nita. She's worth the effort. She's one of the ones. I'm so glad we did. For the last 14 years, we've seen 224 girls actually get rescued from sex trafficking, get a job and an education and hope for the future. And over 200 girls from a Buddhist background have put their faith in Jesus Christ. They know him and he's healing them one day at a time. And it has renewed my faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is a salvation for anyone you ever lock eyes with. He can heal anyone. doesn't matter how dark, doesn't matter how broken their lives are, He can heal anyone. Just notice the ones. If you're not called to go to Cambodia, then you're called to level four of the office block that you work in or you're called to your local school. So pray this simple prayer. God, who do you want me to notice? Who do you want me to notice that needs to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Just help me to notice the ones. Secondly, prioritise the ones Shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one. The woman searches a house to find the one lost coin. The one that's lost becomes the priority. When 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 something's a priority in our life, we've got a plan. All right? If your fitness is a priority, you've got a fitness plan. If your finances are a priority, you've got a financial plan. If God's mission is a priority, we need a plan. What what are you going to do? How are you going to prioritise it? I tell you one of the the tells. If something's a priority in your life, it turns up in your calendar and your bank statement. 
How is the mission of God turning up in your calendar and your bank statement? How are you making time for people far from God? And how are you giving together as a church? And I know that you are. I know you're a generous church. How are you giving together as a church to reach lost people all over the world? I actually wonder whether the biggest challenge for some of us in Australia is actually not as much money, but it's time. How are we making time to prioritise the ones to sit around the table like Jesus and welcome sinners and eat with them? Thirdly, welcome the ones. This is what Jesus is getting in trouble for. This is why he tells these stories. If you're going to get in trouble for something, and I regularly get in trouble. Put your hand up if you ever get in trouble. You know, I, I get in trouble all the time. But if, if, if you're going to get in trouble, you might as well get in trouble for the same thing that Jesus gets in trouble for. Welcoming sinners. And, and, eat, and eating with them. I, I say to my church once a year, in fact, I'm going to say it again uh, next week, I want to smell more smoke outside the doors of our church. I want to see more hangovers in the foyer. I want to hear more swearing over a cup of tea at, at, at the end of the service. Not because I think they're good things to do, and I'd prefer if it wasn't the pastoral team. But it's a sign to me that we're a community that welcomes people just as they are to hear the good news of Jesus. And I tell you, it takes a whole community to welcome the ones. And lastly, celebrate the ones. We've already, Dan's already done that for us. Two people getting baptised later this morning. Great celebration. All of heaven celebrating. I, I remember uh, a few years ago now baptising a, uh, a young woman in our church named Kate and Kate asked me to dedicate their kids when they almost died, completely unchurched background, very successful in uh, business, and they just sat in our church for four years, never heard the gospel, never been part of church growing up, and they just sat, and, and they were allowed to belong before they believed. And I remember the day they finally put their faith in Jesus Christ, and I got to stand with them down the front and, uh, and pray for them. And I, God just reminded me, this is not a lifestyle change. Their eternal destiny has just changed. They're one of the ones. And I'm here to say I'm so glad that somebody thought my grandfather was worth the effort and was willing to make the sacrifice. Because in 1952, when he'd never heard the gospel and he'd never been part of a church, he'd come back from World War II and uh, had no interest in Jesus. My grandfather Frank had a neighbour named Frank. Have we got any Franks in the room? This morning, in 1952, there was Franks everywhere. All right, <laughs> neighbour Frank would constantly just walk across into my grandfather Frank's backyard. They had no fences uh, back then, and he'd keep inviting him to church. And my grandfather Frank rejected him time after time after time. He couldn't remember how many times, but many times he rejected him. But then in July 1952, neighbour Frank came to grandfather Frank and uh, said, "I've just bought a car." You've got to remember, in 1952, my grandfather never had a car. He'd never driven a car. And neighbour Frank said, if you come to church with me on Sunday night, I'll let you drive my car. <laughs> my grandfather changed his mind. <laughs> and he went to, went to uh, church on July the 6th, 1952, in this little church in the western suburbs of Sydney. And until the day he died, my grandfather would say, before that day, I never knew I was a sinner that needed a saviour. But on that day he heard the gospel and he put his faith in Jesus Christ and I've got his baptism certificate that I carry with me everywhere I go. It says, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, believing this with all my heart and resting wholly upon the finished work of Jesus for salvation, I confess my faith in him at Epping Church of Christ on the Lord's Day, July the 6th, 1952, and was buried with Christ in baptism, Frank Ellsmore, a sinner saved by grace. My grandfather died over 25 years ago, but my grandmother lived to the age of 99 and only died two years ago. And we had to fight over who was going to lead her funeral because seven of us are full-time pastors in the church somewhere in Australia and four generations, every single one of her family was there on that day. Not happened very often, we come from all over Australia. Four generations gathered at her funeral. Every single person, fully devoted follower of Jesus, serving somewhere in a local church in Australia. How did that happen? Because one old dude named Frank thought my grandfather 
was worth the effort. And even though he got rejected time after time after time, he did not give up on my grandfather. He decided he was worth the effort, he was worth the sacrifice. And he came to know Jesus and four generations later, a whole family is redeemed. The whole family knows Jesus. Can I encourage you today? Notice the ones. Prioritise the ones. Welcome the ones just as they are. And celebrate every time one person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. And who knows what else God will do. I'd love to lead us in communion as we, uh, as we finish this morning. You would have got uh, the bread and the juice as, as you came in. Let me just read that scripture again that I read before. In 1 John 4, verse 9 and 10, it says this, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. It's not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son Jesus as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The value of that which is lost determines the sacrifice that you're willing to make. I don't know when it was that you put your faith in Jesus Christ, but there was a time when an all-out search was called for you, whether it was in your family, whether it was through a neighbour, whether it was through something you, uh, somebody reached out to you at work. That was the Spirit of God, the love of God searching for you. He's just so valuable to the Father. He was willing to give his one and only Son so that you could know his life, you could know his love for all eternity. As we take this little wafer, which is a representation of the body of Christ, I want you to eat it and remember how much God loves you, how much he values you how much he was willing to give so that you could enjoy a loving relationship with him for all eternity. Let's eat and remember. This cup is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. He gave his life for your life. He shed his blood so that you could live, you could live an abundant life, a life of purpose, a life of eternal mission, an everlasting life. As you drink this cup, thank God. Thank God that you're part of his family. And you're actually part of his eternal purpose in this world today. Let's drink and remember. Father God, thank you. Thank you that it is your heart. It is your heart for this family at Ross Trevor to grow and to multiply and to flourish. Thank you that every person here today with faith in you is one of the ones. You see us all. You know us. You are the one that's drawn us to yourself by your spirit. And Father, I pray that you would give us your eyes today. Give us your eyes to notice the ones, to prioritise the ones, to welcome the ones, and to celebrate every time one person puts their faith in you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand together this morning? We've got a final song to sing, but I just want to encourage you. I've got, I got something really simple I'd love to give you as a gift. Don't tell me Queenslanders aren't generous. 
I got a whole pile of one cent pieces down the front on both sides of the stage. If today you'd say, I want to be part of God's mission. I want to simply notice the ones. And maybe there's someone already in your heart today. You know who that person is. You've already noticed. I'm going to prioritise some time to spend with them around a table, to share with them what I know about Jesus. I'm going to welcome them into my home, into my church family. I'm going to celebrate with them one day. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for them every day. I'm going to put this little one cent piece somewhere where I remember, stick it on my windshield, stick it on the fridge, put it in your wallet. I'm going to pray for them every day until it happens. I just want to encourage as we sing this final song, come and take one. Put it somewhere where you remember the value of ones.